Welcome to 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby. My guest today is Dr. Joe Yuzinski from the University of Miami. Is it Dr. Joe, Professor Joe? How do you like to be referred? Well, Joe is fine oh. um, for okay. the purpose of this conversation. So, <laughs> Okay. I have a bio on you, and it's quite extensive, so I'm just going to read a bit of it, but it's important because I want to get your information out there so that people know what we're talking about today, which is conspiracy theories because you are a conspiracy theory expert, or at least you have come to be one. I don't know if that's where you started, but now you are. Joe Yusinski is a political scientist at the University of Miami. He studies public opinion and mass media with a focus on conspiracy theories and related misinformation. He received his bachelor's degree from Plymouth State University, his master's from University of New Hampshire, and his doctorate from University of Arizona. His research has appeared in Journal of Politics, Political Research Quarterly, and Critical Review, among other scholarly outlets. For the rest of us, he has written for The Atlantic, The Washington Post, The Guardian, Newsweek, Politico, Fox, The New York Times, and more, and has appeared on CNN, CBS Sunday Morning, and several other media outlets. You are the author of Conspiracy Theories, A Primer, The People's News, Media Politics, and the Demands of Capitalism, and you are co-author of American Conspiracy Theories and editor of Conspiracy Theories and the People Who Believe Them. Thank you so much for being here. There's so much going on and things just seem to be out of control. So that's actually one of my questions we'll get to. But before we start the conversation, I just wanted to say that um, I have a lot of questions for you about your research and how you conduct your research. So I'm not going to specifically mention too many conspiracy theories because I don't want to lead the conversation in one way, but feel free to use any example that you see fit. All right? Now, before we begin, can you just set up the stage for me with a couple of definitions? Because there's a lot of terms that get floated around in the media, and I'm not, they're not all synonymous. So I'm just wondering if, if you can tell me about misinformation, um, disinformation, polluted information, malinformation, and conspiracy theories. They're not all the same thing, right? So on a Venn diagram, all of those concepts would overlap. So conspiracy theories, misinformation, disinformation can all be sort of the same thing. Um, but they're not always the same thing. So a conspiracy theory is an accusation that a small group of powerful people was working in secret for their own benefit against the common good and in a way that undermines our bedrock ground rules against the widespread use of force and fraud. And that this is a conspiracy theory because it hasn't been shown to be true by the appropriate bodies of experts with open data and evidence, right? So a conspiracy in this sense would be like Watergate. We know what happened. People made admissions in open court. It was a small group of people, Nixon and his, and his associates who undermined the constitution, but we know what happened. So we call it a conspiracy. But if you think that the CIA killed Kennedy in 1963, well, that's a conspiracy theory because there aren't any expert bodies that have shown that to be true with open data and evidence. Let's clear something up also right off the bat. Lack of intelligence is not a requirement to believe in a conspiracy theory. Many people can be susceptible, and I'm thinking all kinds of people from the laymen all the way up to PhD and medical doctors, and specifically I'm thinking there's been a lot out about these so-called American frontline doctors or America's frontline doctors that have all kinds of theories about COVID-19 and alien DNA and vaccines are actually making people become less religious. So those are highly educated people, right? So it's not limited to what you would call just um, a Yahoo out in the hills of Maine or something. Yeah, so if you were to close your eyes and think about who is that prototypical conspiracy theorist, you might imagine a middle-aged white conservative guy living in the basement with a ham radio and a tinfoil hat. Um, but that's not really what's going on out there. I mean, this is something that, that, that anyone can engage in and pretty much everyone does to some extent, some people just more than others. Um, so when you think about who believes conspiracy theories, it's everyone. Because what we find on our polls is that the more conspiracy theories we ask people about on any given poll, the fewer and fewer people there are that don't agree with at least one or a few of them. 
Last year, I polled on, I think, 20 some odd conspiracy theories and 92% of Americans in our poll agreed with at least one. Now, imagine I was to ask about 100 conspiracy theories. Everyone would buy one or a few. So it's something we all do um, to some extent or another. And if you, I tend to find that education tends to get people to believe in fewer conspiracy theories, but we're not sure why. And that's just an average across the population. So you could come to one of my faculty meetings. You'll see all sorts of conspiracy theories getting thrown around. <laughs> really? Great. Those must be some fun meetings then. <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> let's let's speak about that though. How do you gather data? You just mentioned polling, but so you do polling and surveys. Do you do social media algorithms? Do you listen to AM radio? I mean, what's the most reliable way here? Most of what I do now is polling. So we do national samples, and and because I live in Florida, I'll do some statewide samples, and I essentially put conspiracy theories onto the survey and ask people if they agree or disagree with them. And what we find is that some conspiracy theories, a lot of people agree with. Some have majority agreement in the country. Some are much more fringe. So for example, uh, conspiracy theories about who killed President Kennedy in 1963, those are fairly popular. Um, so what I'm finding now is that about 45% of the country believes in some form of Kennedy conspiracy theory or another. When we ask about the deep state, we get a similar number thinking that there's this unaccountable deep state that's really controlling things. I think last year, the most popular conspiracy theory you pulled on was uh, that Jeffrey Epstein, um, the, the billionaire, um, I guess, sex trafficker, was uh, was killed rather than hung himself. So we, we got about 50 some odd percent agreeing with that. So so some are incredibly popular. At, in its heyday in the 1970s and 80s, Kennedy conspiracy theories were believed by about 80% of the country. So you were in the minority if you didn't believe in one of those theories. I wanna ask a follow-up question to that. Um, how do you poll and get a straight answer? Because you must have to ask the question in a certain way. You don't just go, do you believe Kennedy was assassinated by a lone wolf or do you think it was a conspiracy? Or do you just blurt it out like that? So I'll put a statement on, on the survey and I'll, and I'll give a prompt. And the prompt will be, here are some ideas that some people agree with and some people and other people disagree with. Uh, please express how much you would agree or disagree with each of these statements. And then we'll say something like, you know, the, the CIA assassinated President Kennedy in 1963. So people can be free to, to say they agree or disagree and how, how strongly they agree or disagree. There's often this view out there that somehow people aren't going to be honest on surveys and stuff like this, but people are incredibly honest with, <laughs> with things like this. You would, you would assume that people were going to hide their beliefs and be like, oh, there's a conspiracy and the government's watching how I respond to this poll, so I'm gonna lie and say I don't believe it. But we get massive numbers agreeing with these things. And what we find is when we do follow-up questions that these people are incredibly um, consistent with how they view the world and, and the beliefs they have. So, so it's, it's pretty clear that they're being, for the most part, very honest. You mentioned a couple of conspiracy theories, but uh, and that the Kennedy had been reduced greatly, like cut in half, JFK conspiracy. Mm. Um, what is there any most popular right now? So the most popular I've polled on in the last year is Jeffrey Epstein okay, being said. murdered rather than killing himself. Um, Kennedy is, has been coming down. So it's around 45% now, uh, coming down from its high. Um, but essentially what you find is that they're all not equally believed. Some have very few believers. Some have almost a majority or slightly more than a majority. So for example, when I tell people the concept of conspiracy theory, often what comes to mind is, oh, Kennedy, uh, the moon landing was faked, things like that. Kennedy's popular still, but the moon landing was never really popular that that was faked. I mean, that polls around 6%, barely anyone you know, believes that was faked. And part of the reason is that the moon landing is part of our national pride as Americans. That's something great that, that we did. 
Um, but when you go and ask other countries, did the U.S. fake the moon landing? Then you get bigger, <laughs> bigger percentages saying, yeah, so it's almost 20 percent in France to think that we faked it. <laughs> I want to ask about the overlap there. And you mentioned JFK and the moon landing. And 30 years ago, you know, and I don't know if it was 30, 80 years ago, whatever. I'm sorry, not 80 years ago. But back in the 80s when I was in high school, you did hear about conspiracy theories, but it was always the same three, the moon landing, uh, Area 51, I think, and JFK, all right? They'll, those were always coming up. But now you hear about so many different things, like everything's a conspiracy, flat earth, um, vaccines, everything in medicine except for the few that know the truth, the deep state. Um, you mentioned Jeffrey Epstein, something about the Denver airport I've heard recently, Illuminati, chemtrails, all this kind of stuff. So. Are there more conspiracy theories now, or is it just more publicity to social media? It's more publicity from the mainstream media. Oh. And it's not really an effect of social media. Um, I mean, social media is only involved in so far as the mainstream media likes to report on every dumb thing they find somewhere on Twitter. Just to put this into numbers, what I found doing a Google alert for the last 12 years was that the media is reporting much more on this now than they were in the past. So this Google alert every night gives me every story written with the term conspiracy theory in it. And 10 years ago, I would get back two to three stories every night that had conspiracy theory. Since 2015, it's been 50 to 100 stories every single night written on the topic of conspiracy theories. Most news outlets now have teams dedicated to misinformation, disinformation, and conspiracy theories. So it's something that, that we're very much paying attention to. But that's very different than saying that there's more of it now than there was in the past. I mean, those are two very different things. So what polling is showing um, is that these beliefs aren't going up. So whether it's the general disposition in the country to believe in conspiracy theories or belief in very specific conspiracy theories, it's not really going up. It just seems like it is because the media is talking about the phenomena a lot more than it ever did in the past. I want to ask you a question about demographics because you mentioned that we all imagine the person that has a tinfoil hat and lives in his mother's basement or whatever. But are there any reliable predictors of who might be more susceptible to a conspiracy theory? Is it education based? Is it, I don't know, left, right, male, female, um, young, old, jazz versus rock and roll, anything? I, <laughs> I mean, it would be nice if, if I could say, oh, yeah, they have a mark on their head or they wear a funny looking shirt and you can pick them out of a crowd. And that seems to be what everybody wants, but there's no such thing. I mean, I guess one way to think about it is they walk among us, right? Because they're not that much different than us. We all believe in these theories to some extent, some people just more than others. So trying to delineate us versus them is sort of tough to begin with. Um, but even when we're talking about trends, like who's most likely to believe conspiracy theories, um, even then, we only have very rough answers. So I can say that people who make less money and have lower levels of education are more likely. But they're not that much more likely. And that's not determinative of anything. And even when I say that, it's not the case that, that education or income cause people to believe in more or less conspiracy theories. We're not really sure what the mechanism is there. So think of it this way, it could be, and as someone in higher education, I would think, I would like to think at least that um, education rids people of their irrational beliefs. Or it could be that institutions of higher education sort of eschew conspiracy theorists and push them out. <laughs> it, could be either, it could be either way. Same thing with income. It could be if you make a lot of money, all of a sudden you feel comfortable and you, you don't believe in more conspiracy theories because of it. It could also be that jobs that pay a lot of money aren't going to hire raving conspiracy theorists, right? So it could be going in both directions. You mentioned the Venn diagram earlier on and the polling and everybody believes something. Is there a, a subset that will believe almost everything? They're just so into this belief pattern that JFK is a conspiracy. Everything the government does basically is conspiracy. We never get accurate information kind of thing. So... Yes, 
people, here's the interesting thing, is that we tend to think of people in terms of conspiracy theorists and not a conspiracy theorist. That's not really a helpful dichotomy because it's not clear what separates those two groups, given that everyone buys into one or a few. Um, but there are some people who are just really into conspiracy theories and think everything is a conspiracy. It's everywhere they look. It's explained by shadowy conspiracies, by powerful people that they don't like. And for other people, they're much more picky and choosy with it. You'll have people that, oh, I believe something funny happened with Kennedy. And I think, you know, there's something weird about Trump and Russia, but they may not believe in anything else. Right. So. So to answer your question, yes, there are some people that are just so much into it that that's just how they see the world. They believe tons and tons of conspiracy theories, but for everyone else, they're, they're fairly um, discerning when it comes to which ones they'll adopt and which ones they won't. Let me ask um, a question that may seem um, odd, but I'll play devil's advocate here. What's the harm? So, you know, people believe something and they get together once a year in a hotel ballroom. They talk about UFOs. I mean, how's that affecting the society in general? I mean, what do I care that, you know, there's a few thousand people that get together for a weekend? In most instances, I don't care. And most of us probably shouldn't care. I mean, part of a free society is that people have to be able to believe whatever they want and explore ideas and gather evidence for those ideas. And that's completely fine and healthy. But the other side of the coin is that beliefs can drive actions. And if your beliefs are separated from our shared reality, then your actions could be potentially very dangerous. So if you think that there's hidden dangers to vaccines and you don't get vaccinated, you're not only putting yourself at danger, you're putting other people at danger. If you think that you know the government is part of some plot to kill you, then you may wanna fight fire with fire. And you might take action on that. And we've seen instances like that. T Timothy McVeigh comes to mind immediately. And he, he, he blew up the Oklahoma FBI building in, in the 1990s. So, so because beliefs drive actions, if people have beliefs in which there's some group who's out to get them, they might want to act on that. We're taping this on February 16th, uh, 2021. I'm just coming off of January 6th. I know it's kind of early to tell, but I think that Congress maybe is uh, banding about the idea of a, um, an investigation like a 9-11 commission, a January 6th commission or something like that. And we've all seen those video clips of maybe eight or 10 people walking together, holding hands or the shoulder on the arm. So it looked like there were a variety of different groups there. But is there any leaning that um, those were multiple conspiracy people all at once or some overlapping large conspiracy? And I don't know if you can answer that question or not. Well, you mean who was at the January 6th riot? Yes, is, is that a conspiracy theory when you see eight people together? No, I mean, there's a bunch of people showed up. We know what happened and why it happened. I mean, the president was on Twitter saying, come here and do this. He said it over and over again. And members of Congress and, and people in, in uh, uh, the media, which is sympathetic to Trump, all sang in harmony. They said, uh, the election's stolen, you have to come and fight for it. January 6th, be here at this time and do this. I, I mean, there's no conspiracy there. It was all done fully out in the open. And I'm not sure what a 9-11 uh, style commission would find. It's all there. <laughs> it's, it's, it was done right in front of us. So it's, it's, it's sort of interesting that people are looking back now and saying, we're trying to figure out what happened. We know what happened. The, the, the loudest person on the planet, the president of the United States, the person with the biggest bully pulpit was telling people to show up. They did. Why are we surprised? <laughs> right, so that'll be a great use of taxpayer funds, then a three-year commission on that. Um, but so the conspiracy was actually the opposite, that the election was stolen. That's what we, that was the conspiracy that fueled this. Well, there's all sorts of anything happens, and there's all sorts of viewpoints that come into it, and and some of them involve accusations of, of a conspiracy. So, I mean, to start this, before the election, Trump claimed that the election would be stolen. He said it is going to be rigged if he didn't win, and polls show this that a lot of people believed his rhetoric. 
So about 70% of, of Republicans prior to the election thought that uh, mail ballots were gonna lead to fraud. And, and, and about 40% of Republicans thought that if Biden won, it would be specifically due to fraud. So they already believed this before the election even happened. And then Trump went on after the election onto Twitter and kept saying it was rigged over and over again. I mean, that matters. So to, to, to pretend now that this was some, some magical thing, this riot that only happened on Twitter and that didn't have um, elite driven organization to it is to bury your head in the sand. Let's go back to um, conspiracy thinking in general. And so what's the difference between uh, like healthy skeptical evidence thinking and conspiratorial thinking. I mean, because you can be skeptical about certain things and seek out information. And just being skeptical doesn't make you a conspiracy theorist. So where's that dividing line between, I'm a skeptic about this and I've crossed the line and now I'm taking um, unwarranted evidence, I guess. So skepticism is, I'm not gonna believe something until there is a high burden of proof map. Conspiracy thinking is, I favor explanations that involve a conspiracy, particularly if it accuses a group I already don't like. So skepticism is about trying to rid ourselves of biases and letting our beliefs follow evidence. Whereas conspiracy thinking is um, being, being biased towards particular explanations. And here's the thing, conspiracy theorists will always say, you know, I have a lot of evidence for my beliefs. Well, you know, I'm glad that they're convinced, but it's probably not evidence that drove them to it. Usually what happens is they, they arrive at the conclusion and then if they bother to get evidence, they get evidence that supports what they already believe. I'm wondering about someone that's all in versus someone that just thinks there's something there. I remember I went someplace and somebody was dropping a wrench and he wanted an investigation into 9-11. He said, I'm not saying it was a conspiracy, but I want a real investigation. We haven't done a real investigation yet. And his point was you drop the wrench, it's free fall, and the buildings didn't fall at free fall or something like that. And you know, he doesn't know, but he just wants a new investigation done. So what, what's he telling me there? Is he a conspiracy theorist or does he just want a new investigation? <laughs> Well, the question is, why do you want a new investigation? And it's usually because this investigation didn't give me the answer I want. Right? It's, it's, you know, who complains about the refs after a game? It's the losers, not the winners. So when people don't get the answer they want, they say, oh, the investigation was flawed. I want a real investigation. My guess is, you know, with people like this, is that you can say, you know, we'll give you another investigation, but until the investigation gives them the answer they want, they're never gonna be happy with it. So it's not the realness of the investigation, it's the conclusion of the investigation. What are the parameters that have to be in place for a conspiracy theory to take hold? I mean, is there anything in society that has to be going on, like bad times or good times, or I know everything's almost always politically polarized after an election. Does your research say that there are certain times in society that things take place? Or I'm sorry, that conspiracy theories take hold more frequently? Or is it just random? It's, it's sort of random. And, and, and in one, one way to think about it, it's, it's much more stable than it is sort of flashpoints. So people tend to have their worldviews and, and people have a worldview to one extent or another in which conspiracies dictate events and outcomes. And that's stable throughout their lifetime, how they, how they view the world. So having been polling people on this for the last 10 years, I could say it hasn't gone up, it hasn't gone down, it's very stable. People sort of see the world the way they see the world and that's that. And because those underlying worldviews are so stable, beliefs and conspiracy theories, specific ones, tend to be very stable over long periods of time too, for the most part. So. It's not like something happened yesterday and now we all believe conspiracy theories more than we did last Tuesday. Generally what's happening is that the people who are prone to believing are the ones who believe it. And the ones who are prone not to believing don't believe it. And 
And if we look back in history and think about conspiracy theories, often we're driven by episodes. We'll think like, oh yeah, 9-11 conspiracy theories. Oh, Barack Obama birth certificate conspiracy theories. Oh, it's uh, Trump Russia conspiracy theories. Um, but, but those are just sort of one example of sort of what's going on in the whole current of things. And it, it, rarely do we find evidence that things are going up or changing. It's, it's more every conspiracy theory is just a continuation of what came before. Well, that's really interesting. So you mentioned that, you know, if we look back as an episode, um, and we're in the middle of an episode right now with coronavirus COVID-19, right? But it, it's, it's spawned so, what, ha, what about um, one episode like COVID-19 spawning so many theories? So you've got, you know, um, that it's caused by 5G is a conspiracy theory. You've got that it's because Bill Gates wants to put a microchip in everybody. Um, you've got that the deep state planned it to undermine Trump. I mean, all these conspiracy theories on this one episode. Is that unusual? Or is it, again, just the media we're hearing about it more? It's One, it's the media we're hearing about it more. But two, we're all paying attention to this one thing, right? I mean, we're not paying that much attention to anything else, really. So the entire world's focus was on this pandemic as it should have been. That's where all the news coverage was. So people with conspiracy mindsets were thinking about this too and aiming their conspiracy theories at it. But I got polls into the field right when this started in the US in early March. And um, what we found is that the numbers from March to June to October haven't gone up. So the economic recession hit, the lockdowns hit, it became a full-flown pandemic, death toll went up, and there was a flurry of conspiracy theories on social media, the pandemic video came out and supposedly got millions of views. All the beliefs in conspiracy theories were stable over the whole year. And it was really the same people believing in these theories that believed other theories. So it wasn't like, you know, some random person who didn't believe in conspiracy theories all of a sudden believed COVID was a conspiracy. These people already had a mindset that brought them to that conclusion and they already had other conspiracy beliefs too. So it wasn't, it wasn't the event on its own that was driving it. It was just these people applying their worldview that they already had to this new event. That's interesting because then we're back at that some conspiracy theorists, I guess, believe almost all conspiracies, the people, um, and they're really um, pushing, or I'm not, I shouldn't say pushing the narrative, but they've got a lot of uh, profile now. I mean, some people can be responsible for posting tens of thousands of social media posts and just spreading it that way. Is there any evidence that it's really a small group just pushing this out there as a prank or to get um, hits on their YouTube channel or on their social media posts? Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So, so what we find is that, they, that, that there are key, when you look at social media networks, there are key spreaders um, who, who tend to spread a lot of, of this, this stuff. And same thing in, in public opinion polls is we found that it's a small number of people who believe in almost anything. And those folks also report being likely to share information on social media, even when they know it's false. Even when they know it's false. Even when they know it's false. And, it, 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 and oftentimes it's because it's not so much the theory they believe, it's that they wanna make a broader point with the theory, right? They, I don't like that group and I'll say whatever I can about them. And, and what we find undergirding some of these people's psyches are, sometimes, you know, dark personality traits like narcissism. So for example, I'm right and I want everyone to know it. And they get on social media and they're happy to tell you all their views. Um, so this isn't a case where everyone's sort of become a conspiracy theorist and everyone's spreading everything everywhere on social media. It's a, it's a small number of people. And this is the same thing in other domains on social media too. It's a small number of people who are responsible for most political posts on social media, right? So it, it's, it, it's almost anything like that 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the people aren't really involved, 20% are doing pretty much everything you see. 
I want to go back to the harm a little bit because when people are um, putting forth those and, you know, the media picks up on it, I guess, and it's all over the place, there's some harm, I think, if, like you mentioned, vaccines. Maybe, you know, I just had a baby and I trust my doctor and everything, but I've heard there's something about vaccines, so I'm a little vaccine hesitant. I mean, is there, have you done any research to see how much that harm happens where people just become a little hesitant about certain things? Yeah. I mean, whether it's a little hesitant or a lot hesitant, it leads to the same outcome, right? Not getting vaccinated. And we have seen diseases that were once eradicated in this country 20 years ago come back. I mean, we've had outbreaks of measles in, in several parts of the country due to people not getting vaccinated. It's happened in Europe, too. Um, and then there are there are uh, uh, other countries, um, Africa, where they they don't want to take vaccines either. Um, and so this is part uh, uh, of a big problem that's been going on for the last 20, 20 years or so. I mean, we've had a anti-vax movement. You know, the Robert De Niro's, the Jenny McCarthy's, people who have brought celebrity to this, the uh, Bobby Kennedy Juniors. And it's breathed life into it. And it's been going on for decades. And people have died because of it. That's a harm. And it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna continue, right? Um, particularly with COVID, because a lot of people are not gonna get the COVID vaccine. We see these beliefs now. You know, oh, I think the vaccine's gonna have a chip in it or it's poison or you know something like that. Um, and, and we will see people die unnecessarily because of it. Your answer also brings me back to the beginning a little bit because the people that bring their celebrity to it and um, Robert Kennedy Jr., I mean, these are not stupid people. Um, but the amount of harm that's been done, as you just exemplified, is tremendous. Is there... what? I, I, this is probably a question you can't answer, but what the hell is going on in their minds? People have beliefs. Right, and it doesn't matter how smart you are or how educated you are or how rich you are. Um, if people are convinced of something, they're convinced of something. And we're paying attention to this now because it matters so much, particularly with COVID. Like if you don't believe that the, you know, the virus is real, then you're not gonna wear a mask and you run the risk of catching it and spreading it to others. So our health is dependent on what other people believe right now. So it's all in our interest to make sure that our fellow Americans believe the right things as much as possible so they act in the right ways that protect us all. But it's nothing new that people believe all sorts of weird stuff. I mean, next time you're at Thanksgiving dinner and people can get together, after a few bottles of wine are poured, just ask, ask some conspiracy theory questions around the table. You will find a wide range of, of views that you might not have known before. Um, if you're like me, you might not get invited back <laughs> ever again. So it's, it, it, people believe a lot of wacky stuff. I mean, and that's, that's always been the case, whether it's conspiracy theories or other things. But you, you, you will find in your families, you'll have conspiracy believers, people who are all about horoscopes and people who believe in ESP and aliens and whatnot. I mean, that's, that's all there. And none of those beliefs are very well evidenced, but lots of people believe them. We just talked about bringing celebrity into it or when a celebrity brings a conspiracy theory forth. Um, but what about... You know, if you're in your social chat room and it's just you among your friends, that's one thing. And then the celebrity gets involved and it bumps it up a little bit. Do you have any evidence um, what happens if a governor or a senator or a politician makes a public statement supporting a conspiracy theory? Is that the same as being a celebrity? Um, so here, here's the thing. A lot of our political views come directly from our political leaders. So it's not like people sit around all day thinking through every issue that's out there. Instead, what people tend to do is, you know, if they're paying attention at all to politics, is they'll hear the signals coming from their side and they'll, they'll adopt those views. 
So if the leaders on one side or the other decide to adopt conspiracy theories, then the followers will adopt them. And, you know, a good example of this is climate change. Why do so many Republicans think it's a hoax or a conspiracy? Because Republican senators and presidential candidates and governors have been saying it for 30 years. Of course they believe it. And, you know, why do so many Trump supporters think that the election was rigged. There's no evidence of it. Trump and, and his supporters have been telling everyone it was rigged. So of course they believe it. So it's not, it's not like these people magically fall into these beliefs. Oftentimes it's they're getting it from somewhere. And the ones that are the, seem to be moderately popular, 30, 40% are ones that are pushed by the president Congress, party leaders, uh, conservative liberal media outlets. Um, so, so that matters a lot. And which sort of brings us to a strange place because we have a government who right now is trying to figure out who spreads all the conspiracy theories and how can we stop them? Well, go look in a mirror. I mean, the government wants to crack down on social media and they're blaming social media for spreading extremism and conspiracy theories. It's the people in government who are responsible for this the most. Some random guy on Twitter doesn't have the ability to convince everyone of his conspiracy theories. The president does. Senators do. You know, so if we want to take action, that's where it's got to be. Congress has to hold itself accountable before they start saying they want to take away internet freedom. So I guess I can sum that up by um, authority matters and celebrity matters. Anybody... Not, not just they have a megaphone, but people trust them and they listen to what they have to say. So it's authority and celebrity carries great weight. Yeah, I mean, being a scientist doesn't. <laughs> I can tell you from personal experience, like I'll say this, half your audience is going to disagree with everything I say. I said, we don't, you know, we don't care <laughs> what he says. Um, but they'll listen to whatever Trump says or, or whatever some celebrity says. And hey, that's fine. That's their choice. Um, but people aren't naturally drawn to believe scientists and experts. They tend to believe leaders of their group, whether it's a political group or some other group. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit here. Um, and I want to ask something that's been a little bit troublesome to me, and that's this Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's Bin Laden concept. Um, I'll let you define it, um, but it really boggles me how people can hold two competing conspiracy theories. And I think one of the big ones is, you know, Princess Diana faked her own death and she's still alive, yet the, her government assassinated her, so she's dead. So she's both dead and alive at the same time. I guess I just defined it. <laughs> yeah, so that's exactly what we find, is that people will believe conspiracy theories that are contradictory. So the same person who thinks that Osama bin Laden is still alive will also say they agree with the idea that bin Laden was dead before the Navy SEALs got to him. It's not, it, it, but here's, here's the interesting thing. It's not, so, for a lot of conspiracy theories, it's not so much about the details that matters. It's that they're rejecting an official account and adopting some alternative account that involves a conspiracy. It doesn't matter what it is for the most part. It just matters that they're rejecting the official story and adopting some other thing. So a lot of the people who believe there was a conspiracy to kill Kennedy in 1963 don't really know who did it. They have no idea. You know, some people will say the CIA, some people will say Castro. But the believers will say, I don't know. They don't really have an idea. So it's not as if they have some well-formed theory about who did it, how, and why. It's just that they just don't believe the Warren Report and they're just gonna adopt their own thing. And they think something funny happened. And beyond that, the details don't really matter. You just mentioned JFK again. So what can you tell me about conspiracy theories that have some basis in something that really happened? So JFK was assassinated, that happened, conspiracy comes up around it. Um, COVID-19 is a real thing, we have conspiracies. What about these bizarre conspiracies like, well, I didn't wanna to mention too many, but this QAnon thing that starts with um, the world's being run by a secret elite cabal of blood, um, sorry, child molesting, blood drinking, Hollywood elites and Democrats. I mean, 
that comes up out of nowhere almost to me. Or does it come up from someplace? Don't say yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to say that's real. <laughs> the, uh, so where does it come from? I mean, that comes out of that's just so bizarre. But here's the, here's the interesting thing: is that all conspiracy theories have some tether to reality. They're all seeking to explain something real, right? And they all have some quote unquote evidence that they put forward. So, it, 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 but some, you know, take a lot more creative license for themselves than others. But here's the thing with QAnon. I mean, their basic belief is that there's a secret agent working with Trump to take down the deep state. And this agent's giving them clues in anonymous chat rooms about what's going to happen next um, in their battle against the satanic baby eating child molesting deep state. Um, as bizarre as that sounds, the only new part is the idea that there's a secret agent working with Trump giving out clues in a chat room. All the other stuff, satanic cults, deep state, sex traffickers, baby eaters, some of that is millennia old. And, and, and the idea of a pedophile deep state working against, against the president, that's the plot of Oliver Stone's movie JFK that came out 30 years ago. So there's nothing new there, right? So, so here's the interesting thing is that what QAnon did was just to set up a game for people who really like conspiracy theories to sort of play along and quote unquote, do their own research. Um, but all it did was, was meet out really old conspiracy tropes that have been around for a long time. And, and, I would say the good news is this, that very few people are QAnon followers. We get maybe five or 6% of the country say that they believe QAnon, they follow QAnon, they support QAnon. It's very small and it has not grown despite what the media has said in the last year. The bad part is that some of the beliefs that QAnon adopted and were previously popular like the idea of elite pedophile gangs in Hollywood and government, about 35% of Americans buy into those. But those aren't QAnon per se, they pre-exist QAnon. Um, but those are widespread. And the causes of those are somewhat varied. And in some ways the government's responsible for some of that. I mean, it, 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 w w there is a vast overestimation, for example, of sex trafficking in this country. It exists. I prefer the amount of it be zero, um, but people tend to massively overestimate how much there is of it in the US and they overestimate the involvement of politicians and Hollywood celebrities in it by a lot. But because you keep getting government reports saying, oh, there's, you, you know, we're doing these massive child rescues and, we're saving all these sex slaves and whatnot. Um, but a lot of those headlines are very misleading because all they're doing is um, essentially busting um, adult massage parlors and then calling it sex trafficking. And they're saying they're saving victims who are sex slaves, but they're also cuffing, arresting and, and convicting those, those people that they call sex slaves. So, you know, people are getting the wrong idea about this. It's because a lot of the government is giving them the wrong idea about this. With QAnon, you mentioned a game. You know, somebody set up a game. What? I, I, that's a great, uh, I don't know if you meant to say it like that, but that's a great point I wanted to ask you about. Is there any evidence that this is like a prank or somebody's just doing it to manipulate their own um, social media? Well, it's not real. Right. So okay. we, know, Did I say it was real? we know that much. <laughs> I didn't mean to say it. If I said it was real, I didn't mean to say it was real. <laughs> so here's the thing. I always give conspiracy theories a wide berth in the sense that, well, it's got a better than 0% chance of being true. Right. So there's no way to know who Q is, um, you know, or what their motives are. I don't, I don't think we, we can make educated guesses about who it might be, but um, those would be guesses. Um, but with this one, I, I know it's false and I feel comfortable saying it's false because it's, you know, one of the Q drops accused me of being a deep state member. And I may not be able to convince you I'm not a member of the deep state, but I know I'm not. 
And if Q was truly a, you know, an all-knowing secret agent, they would know I'm not. So, um, it, it, to me, it's bunk. Um, but for other people, there's something there for them. So. And you mentioned you know it's bunk because you were accused and you know it's not true, but you can't convince me. Which leads me to the, <laughs> not, that I'm, not that I think it's true, but my point is, is there a way to disarm a conspiracy theorist? And I don't think, I don't know, you probably can't do this en masse, like this conversation won't help maybe. Maybe it'll help one person or two people, but is there anything that you've noticed or that your research would tell you that you can disarm a theorist, theorist or anything that works? So if it's somebody who just happened to hear a conspiracy theory and they're entertaining it, but they're not quite sure about it, that's when you can say, oh, here's a fact check. Here's a link to an article about it. You know, those are the people that you can, you can get to. If the conspiracy theory is something that's very dear to them, if it's part of their identity, you're not going to be able to change their mind that easily. Because what you're then trying to do is change who they are as a person. And that's, that's going to take more than a link or, or a tweet or an insult or something like that. So um, for some people, yes, but for, for other people, no. And even if you could change that one belief, you, you'd be stuck in a game of whack-a-mole. Because every conspiracy theory you convince them that wasn't true, they would just adopt three or four others. And you'd be constantly in this game of trying to debunk every conspiracy theory they have. So what, what, what you're really contending with is an entire worldview. What about a very well-evidenced rebuttal of something? And what I'm thinking here is um, there was that COVID-19 Chinese biologist that went on the news and said that it was orchestrated in the lab. She published a paper that was not peer-reviewed. It wasn't scientifically reviewed in any way with some co-authors, but somehow it made it out there and she went on the news and did her little conspiracy theory stuff. And so John Hopkins did like an unsolicited peer review and just tore it apart. They wrote like 40 points about how her biological, her biology is just wrong, but she still gets legs. So there's a very official source taking it apart piece by piece. Does that have any effect or is that just more conspiracy? It's, it doesn't really have any effect. I mean, and, and, and so when you say it got legs, all it was doing was just convincing people who already agreed with it. Right, of course, I'm, here I am again. That's the thing. So, so the pandemic video, which came out last year in, in the spring, makes a good example of this. People saying the pandemic is getting spread everywhere. Millions of people are watching it. It needs to be banned. But I was polling on COVID conspiracy beliefs, both before and after this. There was no change. The people who are accessing it, watching it, and agreeing with it already agreed with it. So it's not like it was changing minds. We, we didn't really have much evidence of that. That's really good to know. I mean, I just did it myself. I said it got legs, and, you know, it's just it's more media, I guess, more that I'm just hearing about it more. Before we wrap up, I want to ask you, I know you do research in polling, but do you actually speak to... Um, conspiracy theorists that are deep in um, just just to hear what they have to say? I mean, have you ever interviewed one specifically for any kind of research or paper? And, or have you ever talked to somebody that's so-called recovered and how they got out of it? Um, I, I see. I could give you access to my email. <laughs> so uh, I get a lot of, a lot of emails. I, I talk to, to, to quite a few of these folks. Um, people are more than willing to share. I mean, so so a lot of the people I interact with are either strong believers, in which case they want to convince me of what they believe, or they're believers who are convinced that I'm part of it and they want to accuse me and tell me I'm going to head to the gallows, or um, family members who are concerned about one of their family members who've fallen into conspiracy theories. I've also had family members who invited me over to study <laughs> Uh, their family for my research and find out what's wrong with them. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, I, I it, 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 like I said, come to a faculty meeting and you'll find plenty of people with all sorts of ideas that you can sort of peer into their, their psyches. <laughs> Before I go, tell me a little bit more about yourself because one of your first books about the media, I mean, how did you get into the research that you do? You don't, did you start that way? I mean, you're a political scientist, it's sociology, you have a doctorate. I mean, 
Is this a career path? Uh, I mean, it is now, but I mean, sort of funny. I think my mother's, I, <laughs> I think my mother's asked me a few times, how long, how long are you going to do this professor thing? So, <laughs> no, I didn't so mean I'm it like a, that. Yeah. I'm a tenured professor. <laughs> I'm a tenured professor. I'll be doing this for the rest of my life. Um, I, I started studying media and why, why news outlets, uh, report on the stories that they do as opposed to some other story. And then I, I moved into conspiracy theories about 12 years ago. It wasn't really even a big topic at the time, but I actually had a co-author come to me and say, hey, what about this? So I said, all right, we'll do something. And then, you know, we, we, we did a couple studies, published the book. And then when Trump showed up, everything changed. And, and that was the big watershed moment here where everyone really started paying attention. And then in the UK, the same thing was going on with Brexit. It says, what is this fake news, misinformation, disinformation, uh, conspiracy theory nexus? And it, it, it's been, been a major topic since then. So I'm, I've, I've just been lucky that I'm in the right place at the right time and can contribute as, as best I can to the uh, conversation. Thank you so much. And I should clarify when I say, is this a career path? What I mean is if I go and I look up, you know, at the, you know, my local university under political science and the subsets of that is conspiracy thinking um, research part of that now. That's what I meant. I didn't mean any insult about yeah. that at all. Well, I'm not going back to Papa Gino, so. <laughs> all right. Dr. Joe Yuzinski, University of Miami. Thank you so much for being here on 502 Conversations. I'm Brian Kirby, and this has been 502 Conversations. Thank you.